within the ABF which are set up to address a particular challenge or goal within the industry. Um, one of the first ones for those to spring up was what we're here to talk about today, which is a plant recipe. Um, we've got Alan Sarkisian from Osram and Jason Beagle, who's a local from here in New York, and they're going to take you through what we've done so far, where we're looking to go with it. And yeah, over to you guys. Thanks. All right. Uh, hi, I'm Jason. I'm a software engineer, uh, aspiring indoor farmer, and uh, I do volunteer work for the ABF. Um, I've been working with others in the industry, uh, along with Alan, to uh, come up with a uh, draft for this uh, plant recipe standardization. Uh, before we dive into it, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to um, the companies that have um, helped by uh, giving us feedback and um, even working with us to develop what we have so far. We've got uh, Cool Farm, Hortilux, uh, Osram, uh, Swiss Ponic, Motorleaf, Farm One and a grow box. Um, thank you guys so much. And uh, we hope to get more companies involved with this too, because this is really uh, something that, that everyone in this industry should uh, contribute to. All right, so first question, what is a plant recipe and why do we need a standard? All right, so growers of any level from hobbyists to farmers utilize plant recipes to know what uh, environmental conditions are needed to get the best yield possible. However, uh, as technology is incorporated more and more into the growing that's done, we have more sensors, we have more pumps, we have more uh, lighting sources as well. Uh, we have greater ways in which we can monitor and control a lot of what goes into the growing process itself. And so, really, with this, there needs to be a way for our control system to know what exactly are the you know, important conditions possible for a recipe itself. And so, the plant recipe group at the uh, uh, ABF began figuring out uh, what information about plant growth is important using measurable tools available to growers as well. So this takes us to kind of more of a, a fundamental question. You know, what information do uh, recipes actually contain? So this actually brought us on a little bit of discovery, and this is more as an idea of you know, what exactly is the kind, how is this information represented, and in what range or units is this information being stored in as well. But altogether, there was some kind of underlying commonality that we had with all this. There were certain metrics that were important all throughout, and this brought us to this idea of having three different categories, ones for air, for light, as well as for water as well. Now for our air metrics, these are ones that measure conditions for the air around the plants, whether it's for temperature or relative humidity or carbon dioxide. For our light, or sorry, our water metrics that we have right here, water metrics plays a big role in hydroponics growth. Most importantly, uh, pH and the soluble elements of uh, concentration which is typically used for uh, electroconductivity. Uh, but to be more accurate, you could actually measure the mass concentration of any specific elements, maybe say for nitrogen, for phosphorus, or for potassium, which are some of the more important ones for use for plant growth. But there are many other ones to consider at the same time. When we get to light metrics, we know the light emits photons which cause photosynthesis. Now these photons themselves may have wavelengths that are measured in nanometers. However, some wavelengths may be more desirable than others, maybe ones for say reds or blues. Now additionally, we have white light at the same time. And this can tell basically how warm or cool the light actually is, whether it's the warm amber light that we have on a sunrise or a sunset, or the kind of uh, cool blue light that we have on a sunny blue sky afternoon, right during midday as well. And this kind of color temperature for the white light can dramatically affect the plant growth at the same time. Oh, thank you. See if it works. Testing? Yeah. Uh, Jack, it's not working. Okay. Bye now. Try again. Yeah. Try now. Yeah, you got to hold it really close to your mouth. A little bit better? Yeah. OK. So with these kind of light metrics themselves, there is an intensity for each of the wavelengths that, we, that is used. And this can be measured in terms of lumens for the output itself or for the irradiance that we see in the end. Now, with these three metrics, this brings us to the idea of what are the growth stages that are important for plant growth at the same time. Because ideal conditions can change during a plant growing process, we made sure that the structure of the data format contains different stages. Uh, so conditions uh, can adapt or depend upon the age of the plant. Conditions can also vary depending upon the time of the day. For example, what you might have, say, at the start of the day during, say, sunrise, during midday, or towards sunset, or even nighttime during the end as well. Now, bringing this all together, this kind of defines what exactly should this recipe structure be all about. We want to include information about these metrics, as well as these stages as well. So putting this together, we can actually form what is the actual structure of the recipe and all the information that contains it. But in the end, we need a baseline that really defines what is the, I guess, the default in all of this right here. And this leads us to the default stage. So with this right here, uh, this will encapsulate our baseline settings for each of the nutrients and the metrics. And when we give a metric, we can define that metric in terms of a tolerable range, 
what is allowable, maybe say for minimum and a maximum value, or we can specify this in terms of a precise value in the end. And so we have up here on the screen is a little bit of a kind of an indicator of what this recipe structure could be. We have our blocking at the start recipe and an ending recipe right here. And our default stage defines some of those metrics. One that we have here for air and for water and for our temperature range, we have a minimum and a maximum value from 18 to 24 degrees in terms of Celsius. For our water section, we define a little bit of the pH. And with this, we've said, you know, we precisely want the value of 6.8 as the, the value that should be used for right here. But this is nice for the default stage. But we want to be able to build on top of this as well by having additional stages at the same time. So if we want to build maybe, say, an additional stage, like the vegetative stage itself, we only really need to include with this actually information that is different from one stage to the next. So in this case, we've specified that our error is now going to drop down from minimum maximum values from 18 to 24 down to 12 to 15. Now with this, we don't necessarily need to specify what is the new uh, adjustment for pH because we're assuming the exact same values that we had before at the same time. Now, from this, this all le also leads towards the idea of having some kind of time or duration for all this as well. So for each of these non-default stages, we can maybe uh, decide or define a start time or an end time based upon a 24-hour cycle. Or even maybe say some of the day duration that we have. We're actually going to a little bit of the bottom of the screen. Uh, or maybe possibly we can describe here is a uh, bottom. There we go. Well, actually. Alright, one second. Uh, yeah, we'll go with this. Okay. So, with this right here, we have a duration set for our vegetative state. This is actually in terms of seconds. So, we want to give as much granularity and, and resolution as we possibly can with this. <coughs> but so, for this very large number that we have right here, this defines an overall set of seven days right here that we expect for the vegetative state. Now, for all this, this now brings together uh, the idea that we have a little bit of metrics to find maybe some of the air, the light, or the water as well, and individual stages. So it'd be a good sense to see you know, exactly how does this information, this kind of formatting, take, to, take into account maybe, say, a written kind of uh, description right here for the rest of itself. So I'd like to pass this over to Jason, uh, who'll be able to speak more. OK, so uh, we're going to just go through like a quick demo right now of uh, translating um, <clears throat> Uh, recipe from text instructions into uh, the proposed standard. Um, <clears throat> so I just did a, uh, a Google search, how to grow uh, tomatoes online. I found this site, Bonnie Plants, uh, and there was some uh, useful information in there uh, uh, that we can use for the standard. So the first uh, sentence I'm taking from uh, these instructions are that uh, temperature should be in the range of 65 Fahrenheit to eight, or, or 18 Celsius or more indoors. <coughs> so we start by um, defining our default stage. And then uh, they're talking about air metrics right now. So we're going to put that in our air section. And temperature with a minimum of 18 Celsius. So the reason we use uh, Celsius is because we want to stay uh, with SI units for the standard, um, just because they are standards themselves for, for uh, units. Um, typically, when a farmer is looking at this data, they're not going to be looking at raw uh, XML. They're going to be viewing it through some sort of viewer that'll uh, convert the metrics to their localized, preferred localized uh, <coughs> metrics. So when a farmer is seeing this recipe, they they'd see, uh, an American farmer seeing this recipe, they'd see 65F, they wouldn't see 18 Celsius. So uh, another piece of uh, text from this uh, written recipe is that the flowering, uh, flowering will be promoted by warmer temperatures and best growth is from 75 to 85 Fahrenheit or 24 to 29 Celsius. So 
they're specifying the flowering stage here, so we're going to make a flowering stage. And again, we're talking about air metrics. Minimum of 24 to a maximum of 29. So now, throughout the growth, uh, the growth cycle, um, when it's not in the flowering stage, we're going to keep the minimum temperature at 18. But if, when it's in the flowering stage, the, that minimum value is going to be overridden by uh, our, our new specified minimum of 24. Um, now, a default, uh, we're not, notice we're not um, specifying a default maximum value. Um, that could be concerning because I don't think you'd want your tomatoes at 100 degrees Fahrenheit at, at any time. So uh, why don't we move uh, this maximum from flowering to here, maximum of 29. And since we have that as a default value now. It's redundant to uh, put that as well in our flowering stage because it will inherit the maximum value from the default. All right. Um, so now we can add a couple more metrics. Um, let's add some water metrics. So the met these are metrics that um, affect the, like the water that will be running through the root system of the plant. So we make another section of <coughs> water. And um, specify pH um, to a min of uh, 5.8, max of 6.3. And then we do EC. Minimum of two, max of three point five. Okay, now we can see um, a recipe starting to come together. Now we have some uh, pretty important factors of growing these tomatoes <coughs> in there. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go any further, but obviously we can keep diving in more and more and <coughs> fine tuning this recipe to, you know, maybe. We, uh, we find something wrong with it or we want to experiment something. So we change a couple, of, like one value at a time, like one metric, like the pH or the EC, and uh, just play around with it, see if we get better yields from that. <coughs> okay, um, so probably, uh, you're probably noticing that we're using XML um, in this. Um, there were some uh, pretty important reasons why we chose to, to move forward with XML, though it's not the, uh, the only text format that could be used for this concept. Um, one is it's, it's the most, open, so, uh, most popular open standard for text data. It's been around forever. HTML is built on top of XML. Um, it's supported probably by more programming languages than uh, any other text format. And it has a rich uh, schema support like XSL and LaxMG, which is very important for nailing down a standard like this. It's good to have a, a schema. Um, so a, if, for those who aren't familiar with the, the term schema, a schema is a lexicon that can be used to validate a recipe. It determines what is and isn't a metric and the grammar for how recipes are structured. It can be determined. Um, so in here we have an example of a, um, an invalid recipe. You see we're using um, arbitrary names for metrics like butterflies. Obviously that's not a proper metric or the moon's stage. So um, if you try to feed this into a, uh, a control system that's uh, monitoring your growth, it's, it's going to tell you that this is an invalid recipe file. And it's going to use the uh, uh, schema to, to validate that. 
Um, and then this is an example. So this would be an example of an uh, acceptable uh, <coughs> for a uh, control system to use. Um, so now I just want to step back and uh, talk about what solutions are out there right now and what else is out there. Um, so first is just freeform text. I'm sure anyone who's uh, grown is uh, familiar with this. You, you go online, you find some instructions on how to grow plants, or you get it from a book, or maybe just someone you know write down some notes, and you just have some text. This is good for um, uh, a farmer, because they just need to be able to read, but not that good for a computer if you want to automate your control system. A computer's not going to be able to uh, take out the key metrics out of this block of text and um, and monitor your growth with that. And also, uh, there's tons of proprietary formats out there. There's uh, a lot of great products on the market for controlling uh, grow areas, um, but each one of these has their own proprietary format. Um, and sometimes growers even make up their own proprietary format uh, for storing recipes, like using Excel um, or just text or something like that. This can uh, limit what you can do with your recipe, and how you can uh, use, um, you, you can't, it, it's harder to improve on your recipe when you, when you don't store it in a uh, structured format that's easy to, to modify. Um, there's also some other open source initiatives for ag data out there. I just wanted to uh, make everyone aware of that. There's uh, MIT's Open Ag Initiative and there's uh, the Open Ag Data Alliance. Um, we're hoping to collaborate more with them in the future and combine our efforts. These slides are going to be available, by the way, to anyone who's it, so. Um, so a big point of this, a big advantage of, of uh, keeping text or keeping recipes in a text format is you can treat your uh, plant recipes like source code, and there's uh, some really big advantages to that. Um, and when I say treat it like source code, meaning that the content is proprietary, but the content's format is not. So, in exa for example, uh, how to write C code is not a pr not proprietary knowledge. Every, all, all C programmers know how to write C code in any any uh, company, but the code they write in C is proprietary. That's valuable information. So we need to stop thinking of the format we're using to store recipes as valuable information. Um, okay, uh, what's next? Um, so at this point, uh, we've, we've come out with a pretty good uh, boilerplate for this. Um, and now we're, we're in the stage where we're, we're starting to look for people to start using this and seeing what they like or dislike about it. and. Um, Hopefully we can get feedback to, to make this into something that's useful for people. Um, so there's several ways to get involved. Uh, we have a survey out there for anyone um, who, who grows, just to, to help understand what the requirements are for a grow recipe and uh, what they need in a standard. Um, we have a, a GitHub repository with uh, all the code we've written so far on this, and uh, also this, this presentation is on GitHub as well, if you, if you want to check out the slides later. And uh, yeah, just, we, we need people to try this. To, we, need, we need to know if this is something useful or not, or if we need to change things to make it useful. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and uh, just uh, on an ending note, it's, it's not important that we use the format that we described here, it's just important that we come to a consensus on a standard <coughs> for this type of data. Thank you. Any questions?